We are transforming the impedance through material number two. So we're going to have to normalize using eta two. So we would take eta at a minus right here, eta in, input impedance, divide by eta two. So that's the same as saying eta three divided by eta two. And once we plot our impedance dot on the Smith chart, we would rotate it around the Smith chart towards the generator, however thick the slab material number two is in wavelengths. So we'd have to take D and divide it by wavelengths, wavelength corresponding to material two. So I'm gonna have a subscript two there. So I'm gonna say rotate D over lambda two number of wavelengths. After, we're ro after we've rotated around the Smith chart, we denormalize the transformed input impedance just to the right of interface B. So we would be like right there. We would get an input impedance from the Smith chart and to denormalize we'd have to multiply by eta two. So here we're dividing by eta two and when we're done rotating, we'll multiply by eta two to get off of the Smith chart. And we'll call this eta b, or eta b plus, perhaps, since we're just to the right of that interface. Then we can recognize that it, the input impedance at b plus is going to be the same as that at b minus. So we can get just to the very le left of this interface, and we can recognize an infinitesimally small distance to either side, we're gonna have the same input impedance. So then we can use eta b here, which is the input impedance at interface b, to calculate the reflection coefficient for the slab, and, and it takes into account everything to the right of it. So we've written this before, eta b minus eta one over eta b plus eta one. So notice we're not reading off the reflection coefficient off of the Smith chart. Uh, if we did that, we would get an incorrect number because the value from the Smith chart does not take into account the presence of material number one. So we have to get off the Smith chart. We use that value from the Smith chart here at A to B, and here when we plug it into this equation, then we take into account the presence of material number one. Now for our satellite, think of the Smith chart. If we have a free space in material number three, and we also have free space beyond the satellite towards the ground. So we have free space on both sides of our cover. How thick do we want the slab to be, D? How thick do we want the slab to be in order for the input impedance at interface B to be equal to the impedance of material number one? So in other words, what do we want D to be equal to so that eta B is equal to eta one? In that case, so that we get no reflection, which you can see from this equation. You can pause the video for the moment if you like. Well, thinking of the Smith chart, we would want D to be a half of a wavelength thick, or an integer multiple of a half a wavelength thick. Because this way, when we're on the Smith chart, we would go all the way around the Smith chart and wind up, wind up back to where we started again. If we're a half a wavelength, or any multiple integer of half of a wavelength. So this way, when we normalize and get onto the Smith chart, uh, and when we denormalize again, we would have the same value we back, be back at 377 ohms. Now, one wavelength thick at these frequencies is probably too thin, so more than likely we would want to make the cover some number of half wavelengths thick so that it is stru structurally strong uh, and also it would be easier to manufacture. Now, the kind of covers that we've been talking about exist and they've been used for many years. They're called radomes. And radomes are used in many scenarios, like to prevent ice and freezing rain from accumulating on antennas. 
They're also used to protect antennas from hail and high winds. And in the case of a spinning radar parabolic antenna, radomes protect the antennas from debris and rotational irregularities due to wind. Here is a picture of an early radome used to cover the rotating antenna underneath a Halifax bomber, which was developed in World War II. So this, this um, kind of curved object <laughs> underneath the fuselage of the um, uh, airplane, that's where the radome is covering up the radar system, the rotating antenna. And these two pictures here show a couple radomes on a yacht here for SES broadband for maritime, which provides two-way satellite broadband inter internet service to private boats and commercial ships. And then the one on the right here shows the antenna when the radome has been removed. And then here on the bottom, if you ever see something like this, where some of the antennas are covered by a radome, like this one, and some of them are not, like here, uh, they're all going to be subject to the same weather conditions, right? And the same wind. So why would you cover some and not others? Well, in this case, the radio means someone wants to keep the orientation of this antenna inside secret so that we don't know in which direction it's pointing at any given time. And indeed, this image is from a UK government satellite ground station. So we can anticipate that they might want some of their antennas to be more private. All right, uh, take a moment, take out your in-class project notebooks, and make a note about how we can use a radome to cover up the cameras on board of our satellite, and what the purpose of those radomes would be, and how thick the radome would need to be.